Hi everyone, I'm Abigail Penny. I'm the Executive Director of Animal Equality UK. Uh, we're a charity that focuses our efforts primarily on farmed animals, given the scale, the severity and the intensity of their suffering. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Peter Egan. Um, he's a much loved actor and an outstanding animal activist, one of the best I've ever come across. So. He's also a long-standing supporter of Animal Equality's work, um, has been for many years now. Um, so thank you, Peter, so much for taking the time to chat with me today. It's a great pleasure, Abigail, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. So as you know, we're here today to talk a little bit about um, Animal Equality's campaign to ban the importation of foie gras made by uh, force feeding. So at the moment, it's actually uh, illegal to produce foie gras in the UK but we do hypocritically still import foie gras uh, but before we get into the deep and dark uh, seriousness that is foie gras I did just want to hear a little bit about how you're doing um, you know I know it's been a really challenging quite a turbulent time for many people understandably my heart really goes out to everyone who's been affected so I suppose what have the past few months meant for you personally? Well, it's been demanding, as demanding for me as everyone else. Um, it's uh, a, a very strange experience for all of us who love our freedom to be in a state of lockdown and having our ability to travel so limited. Um, and of course, uh, it, it, it puts demands on one's life in so many different areas. Uh, it may, uh, what has it done to me in this? Uh, I mean, I, 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 I've used my time, I hope, very, very um, well, because I've, one, I've had a, a great opportunity to spend more time with my wife and my dogs, and they've appreciated that a lot. Um, but also, I've been able to give a lot of time to all the charities that I support, all the animal welfare, animal rights um, charities that um, I am devoted to. And it's, I've made, I, I found myself thinking a lot about the way I respond to um, being, for want of a better word, imprisoned has made me think about all of the animals that we know uh, experience such dreadful lives, either in intensive farming and the way they are cramped and caged together, or in the ones that I use for medical testing, um, the bears in China and uh, Vietnam who are in cages for 30 years, their entire lives, um, just to, so they can have their their bile taken from them. Um, so uh, I, I, I've realized even more how wrong that is and why these poor creatures go insane, really. And so that, as well as all of what the dreadful thing about this COVID 19 it, it is constantly referred to as an animal. Uh, the, the reason it's happened is because of animals. Of course, the um, the virus uh, comes from animals, but the reason it has happened is because of human beings. It's because, so it's a, a human being made virus uh, rather than an animal made virus because we insist that these poor animals are kept in the appalling conditions that they are kept in, either in the extreme markets in Southeast Asia or indeed in intensive farming facilities and animal agriculture throughout the Western world. And we are, we are creating the conditions for these superbugs to go on, get stronger, and to continue to infect um, in a zoonotic way, jumping from animals to humans. Um, so uh, it's something that we have to um, face head on. It's something we've got to, we have to change our lives as far as this is concerned. If we want to, to one, preserve our health, but also the health of our wonderful planet. And of course, having been, again, sort of incarcerated in this way for this uh, long period of time, I I've spent many, many hours thinking about all of those things and reflecting on them. And it has, um, it, if ever it was needed, it has hardened my resolve to make the world aware of how appalling we, human animals treat every other species on this, our wonderful planet, and that we have to do something about our attitude in terms of commodifying other species and our sense of dominion over all other species and our planet. We've got to stop it. We've got to look at what we're doing 
and we've got to treat other species with respect. That's the only way we are going to become healthy again, and it's the only way we're going to heal our planet. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah, I, I really do, and I feel um, clearly you're incredibly passionate about it. You were before, but you know, like you, I, I feel the whole experience has really opened my eyes to to what it must be like to be these these beings that are sentient and feel pain and feel sorrow and feel a uh, desire for life who are just trapped in in these small sheds or in these terrible situations that they they really don't deserve um but yeah. i actually don't think we're the only ones either which i think is also a, a slight you know uh, silver lining on the whole experience is that actually uh, a lot of people seem to be kind of opening their eyes to this more and more you know we were already seeing a vegan boom we're seeing more and more people uh, actually becoming aware of this and uh you know i'm seeing so much uh, research and so many headlines uh, where people are trying more plant-based products and yeah mm. I, I know that um, I'm certainly no no cook but I've tried and attempted to improve my culinary skills over the past few weeks and just test out new new products and I think people are are actually joining us and realizing just the the rich depth that a plant-based lifestyle can bring to to your life. I think it's magnificent I mean I find it to be one, the most exciting, creative, and compassionate lifestyle, and also way of eating. And I love, I really, really love uh, following a plant-based um, diet. Uh, it, it is, it, it has a, a fantastic variety of tastes. It's not just lentils and beans. There are so many other things that are fantastic. I personally, health, health-wise, feel so much better. I've been totally vegan for about six years, but I gave up eating meats about 11 years ago. So I find um, uh, following a plant-based diet is so exciting. It's, it's delicious. But also what I like about my own digestion is that since I've given up animal products, um, my digestion is so much better. And I never feel bloated and I never feel over full and I don't get any more of that sort of acid reflux that one can get when you're eating a variety of animal animal products so it's yeah. a it's just it's just wonderful and it, what I also i was fascinated to find out i was just doing a bit of research um the day before yesterday that there are i mean it it isn't huge compared to the 6.5 billion um humans on the planet but there are nearly 18 million vegans on the planet so i think those 18 million vegans should all get together and you know, unite and join up and become. I mean, we be, we are becoming more and more of a movement in the UK. I think there's about six hundred thousand vegans in the UK now, and um, it, it's uh, it, getting better and better exponentially. Um, there's also a wonderful uh, variety of choice now in supermarkets, making um, fast food much easier and very tasty. Um, so yeah, it's great. It's very very exciting, but. I think the most exciting thing is, and I know people find this fanciful, for me the most exciting thing is that whenever I have a plate of food in front of me, I don't have to deal with cruelty. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, in terms of one's soul, it's very, very fulfilling. And in terms of one's commitment to all life, it is very inspiring. So it's the greatest, um, it's the greatest lifestyle on the planet. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, as consumers, what an empowering thought to know that with every single meal, every purchase that you make, you can uh, make a choice for a better world, not only for animals, but for global public health or for the, the longevity of the planet. I mean, that's pretty incredible uh, that we can use our money and our voices in that way. Um, and like you said yourself, Yes, it's twofold. There's, there's one part where knowing the sorrow and knowing the tragedy that's going on around us is incredibly difficult to face, but also knowing that you're helping to end that is pretty inspirational um, and it feels great and really fulfilling um, yeah, just in general as a kind of holistic approach to, to your way of living. Absolutely. I, I, I think I read a statistic somewhere some time ago that one human giving up eating animal products saves the lives of about 150 animals per year so you know 10 people doing it that's 15 yeah. animals. a thousand people doing it that's 15,000 animals you yeah know, just phenomenal it's and what's incredible. equally shocking is the thought that to feed in the region of six billion carnivores 
um, between 50 to 100 billion animals are destroyed every year. That's mind boggling. And so the excessive cruelty that exists um, in intensive animal agriculture is just despicable. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we're going to come on to that when we talk about one of the worst kinds of food production, which is um, foie gras. And I read a, a story about a, a slaughterman who said, you know, when a pig comes and snug snuggles your leg like a dog, um, you can't relate to it because you know that in two minutes you're going to kill it. Yeah. So, so they have to treat these these poor creatures as commodities and with contempt. Otherwise, how can they slaughter them? So there is there is no compassion in slaughter. There is no yeah, exactly. And I think you know that actually touches on the fact there are a lot of human rights issues in all of this too. You know, if those people can't simply detach themselves, which in itself is not a healthy psychological attitude to, to have to be forced to take but also these people um naturally often show incredibly high rates of ptsd um and trauma from the experiences that they themselves are having to go through and they are also exploited by this industry so all around we need to dismantle it because it's it's not actually benefiting anybody uh, humans or animals alike well one product that i know will not be on either of our uh, menus ever um, is foie gras. Uh, so for people who are watching, um, can you just describe a bit about what foie gras is and why it's considered to be so horrendously cruel? Basically foie gras is diseased liver. It is the liver of a duck or a goose that has been force fed. Um, the process is called gavage and that's the force feeding of a duck or a goose. They stick a tube down the poor creature's gullet and then they pour um, oil-soaked grain at an extraordinary rate into the poor goose, which forces the liver to swell to a degree where it does become unhealthy. It's very painful, and um, in most cases, uh, this, ha this is a period of force feeding, I think goes on for a couple of weeks, because they, yeah. they can't do it for longer than that, because it will just blow the poor creature apart. But during that um, two weeks, it is aggressive and sickening and horrible for the poor duck or goose. Um, I saw this happening at a foie gras farm I visited two years ago, just outside Bergerac in France, in the Dordogne. Um, and I was standing behind some children who were watching it, and when this woman grabbed the goose by the neck and stuck the tube down its throat and started the process, the children screamed because it was so invasive and horrific. What I found, the whole process I found so deeply shocking when we visited this farm. First of all, um, you, you go into the farm and you go into a field and there's a huge flock of geese and the geese tend to sort of walk in a circle, but they're very, very human friendly, very inquisitive and not frightened. Mm -hmm. And the woman who was running this uh, sort of uh, event, um, she went to the geese and she had food for them and she called them and they all, with their wings flapping, ran towards her because they viewed her as a friend because she was giving them treats and they all surrounded her and she was very proudly saying, look how wonderful these geese are, they all love me, they're all that kind of stuff, which I found really strange. Mm -hmm. um, and very, very touching because they are very, very sweet creatures. Uh, we then moved on into the gavage, as it were, um, uh, building. Um, and these creatures, I mean, I think uh, geese and ducks, some, they can live between 10 and 40 years. You know, so uh, they, they, they are quite long lived um, animals. Um, uh, so these geese that had been so welcoming to this woman in the open field, when we got, when we got into the shed, um, which is quite a big shed, um, and the geese were now unable to really walk, and they were fatter, and they were caught in a very, very, very tiny crush cage. As much as they could, as soon as they saw the woman, they withdrew 
and threw themselves back against the cage because this person that they had trusted had clearly betrayed them and these sentient creatures understood that and knew it and they started to get very agitated and they used that kind of clucking sound which comes as a result of fear. Now this woman just ignored that, grabbed the poor goose by the, by the throat, forced its mouth open in some mechanism that they have for keeping this poor creature in this position, down goes the tube, in comes the uh, soaked grain, um, takes about three seconds, you want to vomit. Cut, out it comes, and as I said, the children in front of me screamed and recoiled in horror. And you could see the line waiting to come and have this imposed upon them were all getting incredibly, incredibly agitated. Um, as I said, it's called diseased liver because it forces the liver to swell to such a degree that it will eventually kill the poor creature. Um, they, they, so they, this happens for about two weeks. They are put through this torture for um, two to three weeks. And then, of course, we were taken into um, the sort of uh, uh, caras the slaughter carousel, the thing that hangs above the top, where they hook the poor creature's um, feet in, neck down, and it, it's just a conveyor belt of slaughter. Um, it, it was horrible. And then, of course, it is the, the livers are processed in certain ways um, and served up as, as foie gras. Um, it's horrible, it is disgusting, and what is also interesting is I think that 76% of France are against uh, the production of foie gras, and we have almost precisely the same amount of people in the UK who are against it. So 76% of two major countries are against this horror, and so I see no reason why it shouldn't stop entirely. And I see no reason why um, the UK hasn't banned the sale of foie gras in this country, because it is the most disgusting way of producing food. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you telling that tale and having witnessed it for yourself personally, which I think is incredibly brave of you to have gone with animal equality, visited this facility and know it, knowing what you were going to see and still being able to, to come away and speak about it on behalf of these animals is really urgently needed um, and is incredibly important to share this with the world. Um, but like you say, there's absolutely no reason that uh, in the UK we shouldn't be um, banning the importation. You know, if we're not producing it here in the UK and we see that as being too cruel, then why are we bringing it in? And as you mentioned, we've carried out a couple of YouGov polls now that have both evidenced 79% of uh, the people who responded actually said they want to see a ban. We've had cross-party political backing, you know, even... Lord Goldsmith himself, who's a key player in making this happen, has said that he sees that there is um, a need to, to look at this and that he, there's strength of feeling there. Um, and there certainly is. And Animal Equality's petition has had over 170,000 people sign it and counting. Um, we've had high, high profile people like you um, kindly put their name to this and it has to happen soon. The transition period is coming to an end um, at the end of the year. At that point, free trade agreements will be starting to be settled and put in place. So now is the primary perfect opportunity to be able to currently draft some legislation and formally commit to a ban and that's why we're really pushing for it at this point. Well it's got to happen um, and I will certainly give it my full support and I'm so delighted to hear it's 79% of people who are against it. You know the cruelty yeah. is extreme and we should not support this kind of cruelty. It's inhumane and um, it's not human. It's just not human. Yeah agreed. So I suppose the last question, I'm conscious of your time, but the last question really is just given uh, the involvement that you've had in our campaign and, you know, you've been there on the front line with us standing outside of Tate Modern demanding that they take foie gras off of their menu, which they did. Mm -hmm. um, well and, you know, you've been with us this whole time and really supporting, supporting our campaign. So what would it mean to you personally, hopefully, when we get the ban in place? I would be thrilled. I would be absolutely thrilled because at least one would know that a few of these poor creatures are no longer being tortured in the way they're being tortured, so that a few in this country have the luxury of eating a disgusting thing like foie gras, of eating diseased liver, 
I'd just be absolutely thrilled. Likewise, me too. And I think it would affect around 250,000 birds. Um, so, you know, we have them keeping us moving forward in front of mind the whole time. You know, it's, it's for them that we're doing this. So thank you so much. You know, as I said at the beginning, to do full circle, you really are such an inspiration and such an incredible animal activist. And I am so proud that we have you supporting animal equality and uh, I think the animals will be glad to have you on side too. So thank you so much, Peter. And Abigail, that's very kind. I'm very touched. Thank you. Thank you.